now that we've started looking at these things called standing wave, we in the last example saw the standing wave particular string, but standing wave can happen within any kind of structure where you can have waves bouncing back and forth. And in this case, we're talking about the ear canal. So in a very crude model, we can imagine that the ear canal looks something like that. That's where your outer ear is, open to the rest of the world. And inside, we can model as basically a straight tube for now, just to keep things simple. And on this end, you have the eardrum, which is closed off. So as the sound travels in and back out, and in fact, when it hits this kind of an opening, some of the wave bounce back as well. So again, we have the sound wave moving back and forth, back and forth, setting up a situation where we have the same frequency, but different direction, giving us a standing wave. However, there's a little something different with this case and the last case, and that's because one end here is closed off, whereas one end is open. For sound waves, what actually makes up the wave is air particles that gets displaced longitudinally. If you are up against a wall like this, your air particle can't move at all. So this side, similar to how we held the string fixed on the one end, you have no displacement. But then this side is open, so there's nothing stopping it. In fact, this is where we get our max displacement possible as the wave adds up and build up. So the type of things that are fit in here will be different from the last case. And we give this type of system a name because it's got an open side and a closed side. We call it the open closed kind of system. And it follows this particular pattern. So here's something that's open and closed. And we are looking for patterns that have the biggest displacement or what we call an anti-node on the open side, and no displacement, or what we call a node in our standing wave on the closed side. If you look at the pattern of the standing wave, and we want to slice out a piece that satisfy these restrictions on the side, I would pick this piece right here. It's got the minimum displacement on the one end and the maximum displacement on the other end. So it looks like that which tells us that whatever this length is in this case, it's one quarter of the wavelength of that wave. Then the next pattern that works, we got to go a little further, and maybe we have to include up to there. So now it's three quarters of the wavelength. And then the next one, like this, which is five quarters of the wavelength, so on and so forth, right? So dealing with standing waves, you got to know how to draw these patterns based on the constraints on the side. From these patterns, we know something about how the wavelength relates to length, and then we can answer the rest of the question. In this particular question, they are asking for the first overtone. So we talked about last time how the biggest pattern gets us what we call the fundamental frequency, and then the next frequency at which you achieve resonance or some kind of big response, we call that an overtone. It's a tone or frequency that is bigger than your fundamental. So it's your first overtone and your second overtone. So in fact, this is the one we're after. So we can then find out the frequency again using V over lambda. Slight complication here. The V here, you're thinking air, so we'll use 343. But because they've given us this temperature, we have to take that into account. And if you want the speed of sound in air at different temperature, we got to go through this particular calculation where this temperature has been Kelvin because it scales with absolute temperature instead of our arbitrary Celsius scales. The conversion is plus 273. So the speed is actually a little bit higher because it's a little bit warmer. My lambda here solving is going to be 4 over 3L, so that's 4 over 3 times 2.4 centimeters, which make it to meters to get per second in the end, or 11 kilohertz. So now, is the air particularly sensitive at this frequency? We look at this particular table. 
Seems like a lot's going on, but this basically graphs out for every single line here, the sensitivity, so to speak, of our ear at the different frequency. Every single line we perceive as the same loudness, so we need a lot less sound here to perceive it as just as loud as this much sound, quote unquote, here. So we're really sensitive down here, whereas at 1100, which is about here, we're not particularly sensitive to this 11 kilohertz, which answers the second part of the question. What is to note, however, is you see where this point is where it's most sensitive? If you go back and look at the first pattern, the fundamental frequency, right, where you have three times a wavelength, therefore a third of the frequency, you find that the fundamental frequency for this particular canal is that, which corresponds quite well to this here, which is pretty interesting. So even though our model might be quite simplistic, it still gave us some information and some applicability to what we can measure with the actual ear canal in terms of sound sensitivity. As a quick tangent, the thing to notice is for open closed system as we have here, the first overtone is the third harmonic. You don't multiply by two, you multiply by three and then five and seven. So the pattern here is different. In any case, I always recommend drawing out the patterns. That's a lot easier to keep track of than to memorize two different sets of patterns and two different situations.